Want to know what I do with my reselling profits? Then check out my sister channel, link will be in the description. Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to be bringing back what's known as the UK reseller Christmas tag video. Now this was started I think in 2015 and I think it was by Caroline Mrs M. I'm not too sure on that, so don't quote me on it, it was a long time ago. Um, and then I think we did it again in 2016, but we didn't do it last year. And I thought to myself, it'd be quite nice just as a, you know, for purposes of documentation, to start this up again this year. Obviously, I'm going to tag someone at the end of this video, so hopefully they will watch this video and then they can continue it on. So if you don't know what this is, it's basically a list of 10 questions um, about your, re your year in reselling, essentially. So I'm going to go through the 10 questions here now bear in mind i've been doing this for quite a while now so some of these things like for example the first question is best pick up i'm not sure whether this was the tail end of last year or whether it is early this year because it all just after you've been doing it for a while it all just merges into one so Please forgive me if it's not quite in this year, but also we didn't do this video at the end of 2017, so it could be kind of for the last year and a half or whatever anyway. But anyway, with all that being said, I'll get on with it. So best pickup is actually I'm going to go with a job lot, which is a job lot of die cast from the auction. Obviously, you'll know I buy a lot of job lots from auctions. The only individual items I pick up of for the last sort of 12 months I've been picking up is from the odd car boot sale that I would go to or charity shops obviously and there's nothing there's not one item this year that i can really say has really stood out to me other than items that i've picked up in job lots so this was a diecast job lot that i got it was only a small uh, job lot actually it was actually in one of the cabinets at the auction house so it wasn't like a huge box of diecast or anything and uh, i paid about 30 quid for this plus commission and one car in it uh, basically i had to you know ask a few people who were a bit more into diecast because at the time i wasn't as clued up with diecast and um you know i asked a few people sort of what i had because some of them didn't even have brands on some of them did have brands on and uh, it turns out i had some decent cars in there and i think about three or four went for 30 to 40 pound each there was one that was a little bit bigger but it was like a wind up one that went for 60 quid 60 or 70 i think it was 60 um and then there was like a load of it probably about 20 or 30 of them only very very small lesney ones these were um but they were between about seven and 15 pound and obviously i've slowly slowly sell, sold through them so it was quite a good little lot in the end you know i made probably made about two three four hundred pound off a 30 pound investment which i was really happy with but it's not necessarily the best pickup because of the value obviously it was a good pickup uh, in terms of you know profit but it was more from what I got from that pickup. I got a good bit of experience with diecast. I, I realised, oh, that's what you can be looking out for in diecast. And these are the names to look out for. And this is the kind of style you can, uh, you know, so you know sort of the age of a, a certain diecast. You know, certain like metal wheels or plastic wheels and all that sort of stuff. And I was looking into it a little bit more. And it was just interesting looking into different things with it. So, yeah, that was a really nice uh, sort of standout um, pickup, really, for me. So, number two is biggest sourcing fail. Now, again, I'm going to um, approach this in terms of job lots because I've not really had one big item that I've spent a lot of money on, you know, like 50 quid, 100 quid or whatever for one single item, and then it's just not worked out for me. I've not really had that. But what I have had is, obviously, you'll be aware that back in January, and you can see this on my channel, I went down the route of doing more household uh, job lots. So I was buying, instead of buying like more antiques and collectibles, I was buying like, um, you know, household bric-a-brac from auctions. And I was paying like £2 a box, basically. And I was very attracted by the idea of paying £2 a box. Because it's like, oh, well, I can't lose because it's I'm only paying £2 a box. And that is true. I realised that you can't, you pretty much can't lose. You're going to make money on one of, there's going to be one item in one of those boxes. You know, if you're getting five boxes for 10 quid or whatever, there's going to be one item. Uh, maybe it's, I don't know, a hip flask or maybe it's a little thermos flask or maybe it's a, um, I don't know, a casserole dish or whatever it is. There's going to be one item in there that will make you your money back and you're going to, you're going to make some profit. But what I didn't realise when I was doing this over the month, you know, through January through to about April I did this, maybe Mar uh, maybe May, um, I didn't really consider the work, the workload that would go in 
to buying these job lots and, and, and really sorting through them because a lot of the stuff was just crap and you just had to sort through it. And you you know, you just have to bin it, you just have to tip it. It wasn't worth doing. So I was ending, you know, I was ending up like doing this and putting a lot more work in than I first thought I would have to. So I've now gone back to more of the, you know, the antiques and collectibles job lots where there's a lot less waste involved. And that means obviously that there's a little bit more margin as well there, even though you are paying up a little bit more per box. I mean, instead of paying £2, now I'm paying more like £10 a box, but there's better stuff in there. So, you know, it's kind of... Obviously, it does both business models work, you know, the, the quantity over quality works, the quality over quantity works, and then my business model, which is a little bit in the middle at the moment, you know, I do a bit of quality and I do a little bit of quantity as well, um, but you've got to assess the workload, and that was my biggest failure. It wasn't necessarily losing money, but it was the failure to spot um, the sort of pitfall I was going to go down with uh, regards to the amount of work I was going to have to put in for the money I was getting back. So yeah, that was probably my biggest sourcing fail, and I've now stopped doing the household auctions, and as I say, gone back to more quality um, sort of uh, job lots and stuff. So number three is best, invi best investment in your business this year other than stock. I'm sure so many people are going to guess this. Back in January, I did the video for this when I got it. And of course, it's going to be my lockup. It's been invaluable for helping me buy more from auctions and just being able to say, right, I'm going to get 20 boxes from the auction. And it doesn't need to go in the spare room because I can go down to the lockup and I can put it there and it's out the house, it's out the way, it's great. A few of the points that I've, uh, and this should be helpful for a few people if you're deciding to get a lockup. A few of the points that I've noticed is the lockup becomes a dumping ground. So you end up putting all the stuff in there and then you cherry pick. You go to your lockup and you get out a nice box of, of great stuff that you can't wait to process and then you're left with the remnants from the haul that you don't want to deal with. So if you're thinking about getting a lockup, I would say get one very, very close to your house and make a commitment to yourself to go down there and every time you go down there, go down there frequently and every time you go down there, you get something out of it that you don't want to process and you just force yourself to do it and then it'll get rid of the the dead weight from it or the dead wood from, from your lockup. So that's something that I did uh, want to mention as uh, something that might be helpful for people who are thinking about getting a lockup. But in terms of the storage space, in terms of the price that I'm paying per month, it's fantastic. It does what I need it to do. And it's got to be the best investment other than stock in my business this year. So number four is uh, best advice you've received from the community this year. It's actually been in the last three or four months, this one. And it's not just from one single person. If I had to attribute it to one single person, it would be Mel from Sparrow's End because I think she made me realize it the, you know, the first one to make me realise it, but then a lot of other people have been talking about it this year. It seems to be one of the main topics in the reselling community over the last few months, or at least I feel it is, and that is um, not comparing yourself to others. So I suffer massively with this. I've always been like, you know, I'm not as good as them, and it's not necessarily just my reselling. It's like I watch some creators on YouTube who aren't even in the reselling niche. Some of them are in the crypto niche. Some of them are in you know video production niches and all the rest of it. You know, like very di very different niches. But I look at them and I think, why can't I edit like they can? And then you go into that spiral of, well, I mustn't be good enough. I, I've you know I've not got the skills. I've not got the ability. I've not got this. I've not got that. And you go into that very negative spiral instead of saying to yourself, look, they can edit really well. That's brilliant. Now, how have they got to that? Because that's obviously something I feel like I want. So if I want that, let me find out how they got to that and let me just apply it to my own sort of journey instead of comparing directly me to them, you know, and saying I can't do this, you know. So I think that not comparing to others. So looking at someone and maybe they they have what you want so they have 10,000 subscribers you want 10,000 subscribers you look at that and instead of going into that negativity you think to yourself right how did they get to 10,000 subscribers and, and is there anything that I can apply from their journey that will mean I can get to 10,000 subscribers etc or in your reselling world going back to reselling now you know they do 5,000 a month on eBay 
is there anything I can take from their journey that I could apply to my journey and it fits within my journey uh, to help me get to 5,000 a month free selling, right? And it might be the fact that, oh, well, they've chose to do higher value items. So does that, is that something I would want to do? First off, you want to ask yourself. And if it is, you then think, right, I'll go down my path of, of doing that. They might do higher value toys. You might not want to do higher value toys. Your path might be antique. So you do higher value antiques or something like that. But you've got to not compare to... You've You've got to kind of look at other people but not compare in a negative way just compare in the fact of uh, thinking what you want you know out of that that's what I've kind of learned over the past few months from various different people so um, yeah that that's definitely the, the big one for me the best advice I've received really uh, number five is funniest slash strangest reselling experience of the year I actually changed this question a little bit it did say funniest strangest boot fair experience of the year but I've not really been to many boot fairs, so I'm just going to say reselling experience. And I, I had trouble with this one. I didn't really know whether there was a funniest or strangest experience. But I just put, because this has been one uh, that's kind of folded out over the year, and I've had it a few times. And this is finding items that I've, that I've already sold on my eBay account, and then they're back on my account. So what I mean by that is, essentially, I've sold an item, and you know, I've sold it, I've packaged it, etc., and then it come automatically, like randomly, comes back on my account. And I've had that a couple of times this year, probably three or four times actually. And it's really, really weird. Now, sometimes what I'll do is I'll sell it, and then it comes back on my eBay account. And then obviously, I've just been looking through my eBay account. I see it, and then I can delete it, so then it doesn't cause me any further trouble. But sometimes Sometimes it'll then sell again and you think but I know 100% I saw the item so yeah that's the weirdest one this year and I know Heather touched on this in a live stream uh, well that sorry my one of my Thursday talks live streams where she had the same problem and she rang up eBay and uh, I think they sorted it out for her or didn't give her a defect or something so I know it does happen for different people that but that is very strange that is a weird that is a really weird one um, obviously, you can you, you can do things to help this, like try and filter out any duplicate listings you may have or anything like that, or just keep looking through your inventory, checking on it, checking on it. But when you've got over a thousand items like I have, it's it's very hard to go through your your inventory on a regular basis or even a semi-regular basis just to double check that everything's right because you might make a mistake anyway because you don't know you can't possibly know everything that's on your inventory and everything that's sold and cross-reference them and stuff. So. Yeah, that's the funniest of a straight or the strangest experience, I would say. So, bugbear of the year again. This is going to be changed from boot sale bugbear of the year, um, but just I just put bugbear of the year. That has to be my recent. Well, I say recent, probably about three months ago now. Um, I had a PayPal hack. Um, now, it wasn't so much of a bugbear. I did actually get it resolved very, very quickly. Um, I acted very quickly on, when the hack came in. I stopped the um, unauthorized transactions going out of my PayPal account. And I was able to sort of um, basically just get my PayPal account sorted within about three days. But it wasn't necessarily the whole bugbear of it. It was more the emotional stress of those few days of thinking, yeah, I mean, even just that minute when I saw unauthorized payments going out, very, very stressful, uh, not a situation I would want anyone else to be in. I know a few people have had have been in this situation with having PayPal hacks. Obviously, I, I updated my uh, passwords and all the, all the rest of it to make sure it wouldn't happen again or, or they couldn't access my account in any other way. Um, but yeah, that was... That was stressful. I would say it was a bugbear, but it was more the stress of it as well. Um, so yeah, that was the one. That was a big one this year. Um, it, it seems like it seems funny, and I said this on Thursday talks at the time, but I'm actually glad it happened because um, not only now do I know how to deal with it in future, but it's kind of it was kind of like the last bad experience that like uh, an experienced reseller would have had, kind of thing. Like you know what I mean? So. Like, all, all the experienced resellers, most experienced resellers have had to deal with all different forms of problems. GSP issues, account restrictions, account bans, um, you know, duplicate listings, returns, selling items that you don't have in your possession anymore, PayPal hacks, all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, maybe, even you know, Amazon account restrictions and all the rest of it. And, and the one thing, the one problem I hadn't had opposed to every other problem, I had every other problem, but I didn't have a PayPal hack. So it kind of made me think, 
is this my like my little you know kind of signal that I'm now coming into the realm of an experienced reseller because that's like the only problem I've not had and and now I've had it so it kind of it was like bittersweet because I was like I really didn't want it but at the same time it was it made me think you know I've had pretty much all the problems you can have now I mean I'm sure another problem will spring up but I've had the main problems you know the bulk of the main problems so that's kind of quite nice in a way um it's kind of just a because I love reselling and I kind of do enjoy the problems that arise with it it's kind of a sense of pride that I've got through these problems I think that's what it is mentally really with me um, so it's not that I necessarily really enjoy or really like the problems but it's just the pride that comes with overcoming the problems and thinking you know I've, I've had all these problems in reselling and because I love reselling so much I've been able to get through it it's kind of like a marriage where you um, you know, over the years and over the years, you're still together and you've got through a lot of stuff together and you feel more cemented because of it. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to say. It's, it's hard to explain, to be honest. But um, if you're an experienced reseller, maybe you'll get what I mean. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so number seven. Sorry, this video is probably going to be so long. I really do apologize, but I can't help but ramble on this video. And I'm just going to take it as it is. I'm gonna, it's Christmas. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to ramble. Um... So yeah, um, so best feedback of the year. I was scrolling through, I had to scroll through about 30 odd pages to, to look at all these feedbacks, but um, I I couldn't really choose one. There were so many that were just like, thank you, A plus, you know, or great packaging, great delivery, whatever. And they're just all standard ones. I wanted one that stood out. There wasn't really that many that stood out, to be honest. There was one about someone, um, you know, I've got I've got this for my son. Um, I'm really, really happy about it. He's really happy about. He's really happy with it, or whatever. Something like that, anyway. And it's always nice when you get the ones that, you know, obviously a child's been happy with the purchase. That's really nice. But I actually picked out this one because I just thought it was so funny. Um, so it says, "Thank you so much. I'm buzzing." proper good condition too highly recommended fab and it was just the buzzing bit i'm buzzing i thought it was pretty funny um so yeah i wish we i wish we get more feedback like that because that's just I, I thought it was pretty funny i've never seen i'm buzzing in feedback before but yeah anyway whoever that person is that is a cool feedback so um anyway um number eight is uh, product that has surprised you this year so product that surprised me this year and maybe the tail end of last year as well um, is the collector's plate so I've touched on this so much over the last sort of 12 months or maybe a little bit longer than that um, of you know I've been buying collector's plates for a while you know I picked them up I picked up some great collector's plates you know 50 60 pound plates and I've also uh, picked up quite a lot that's sort of a standard £10 range. But I always, um, you know, I've always thought of the last few months that they're just nice sellers. They're just nice sellers. You can get, um, you know, you can get like the Brambley Hedge ones or you can get some of the World Alton Snowman collection and stuff that can go for better money. And then you can just get like, like standard ones that, you know, you can get about £10 for. Some, obviously, the really, really bog standard ones you're only going to get three or four quid for. But what I generally do with those is, and I've mentioned this in the past, is if I get really bog standard ones, you know, just little animals on them or whatever and they're not, they're just from a random collection that you've never heard of. I just bundle them up and I can make some good money in bundles. You know, you could do like a bundle of six, a bundle of eight, and you can get 20, 25 pound plus commission. Uh, plus commission, plus postage even. Um, and you can always pick these up at auction for pretty cheap because not many people really go for them except if they are the really expensive ones. But even if people do go for the really expensive ones, there is still a margin to be made there. So they have surprised me a little bit this year because some of the ones I've seen and that I've uh, researched into, I was amazed at the prices they go for. I really was, you know, just a standard collector's plate or, or what you think is a standard collector's plate can go for 50, 60 quid. So, yeah, that's probably one. I was trying to think what, I mean, I was tempted to say glassware as well because I've got into glassware a little tiny bit this year. I've not sold much of it, but I've got into a bit. And I have to say that some of the money that glassware pulls in, it's insane. Like, it's crazy money. So, um, yeah, I suppose glassware as well as collector's plates, you know, I mean, some of the decanters and stuff I've had and um, some of the deca decanters I've researched and stuff as well. And, you know, all sorts of different glassware as well. And what's the, what's the good one at the moment? Is it like the, um, it's like the... Uh, 
Eastern European glass, isn't it? I don't know where it's from, but it's very, um, it's sort of very stylish looking and stuff. And that pulls really good money as well. And I've never had any of it, but I've done research on it and stuff. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's really opened my eyes to how much money you can get for glass. But again, it's one of those fields that you kind of do need a, a good bit of knowledge in to really, uh, you know, pick up those gems for cheap and, and, and kind of uh, get some really good profit on it. So... Uh, yeah, maybe glassware as well for that question. So, number nine, best seller this Q4. Well, we all know this one. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's obviously been Lego for me. We all know last year, you know, I did my Lego investing and I said I was going to keep it for a while. And, um, you know, I ended up seeing that most of the prices have, uh, have risen pretty quickly to what I actually thought they would do. So, I ended up selling a large amount of it this Q4. It's still selling right now as we speak. Well, not as we speak, but you know what I mean. Like, it's still selling right now today and um, yeah it, it it's just done really well so I'm not going to spend any more time on that it's just got to be Lego this Q4 and maybe even next Q4 as well I don't know what it holds and then number 10 is aim for 2019 so I'm not going to like put a load of detail in this because I'm trying to follow this new regime of not actually telling people my main goals with my business because um, I think that I'll set myself up to failure or I'll set myself up with too much pressure. So all I'm going to say for this one is just generally keep ma maintaining the business. Just, you know, maybe grow it a little bit, but just keep maintaining it. Um, keep my mental well-being good because that's something I've suffered with this year. Um, and just generally, you know, be happy with what I'm doing um, and the rest of it really. I have other goals in mind. I have... Um, you know, a few more growth goals in mind, but I don't want to really save them to put, I don't want to put too much pressure on myself or anything like that. I know that you guys will not put pressure on me or anything like that, but it's more the fact that I'd be just putting unnecessary pressure on myself from talking about it in a video, and then if I don't achieve them, I then feel um, more and more deflated. So, yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, keep maintaining, uh, maybe grow a little bit and, and just do that really. I mean, I'm at the stage now where I've been doing this, you know, three and a half years. It's not going to be, um, you know, I don't really need to grow massively. You know, obviously I can push a little bit more and I can grow it to whatever stage I want to grow it to. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm at the stage where I don't really feel too much pressure with growing it loads. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to say keep maintaining things. So... Uh, with that being said, I know I've rambled for a long time. What are we up to? Tw oh, 22 minutes. Not too bad. I thought we were probably about 30 minutes or something then. Um, but yeah, so I'll leave it there, guys. Don't forget, if you like the video, please do subscribe. Oh, no, I forgot. Wait, before I do the end bit, um, I need to tag someone. So I was going to tag uh, the Steve Green Adventure. I always want to say the Steve Green Experience, but that's my channel, isn't it? Uh, the Ads Experience. But yeah, so... Um, the Steve Green Adventure, so Steve Green, I am tagging you. I'll probably message you anyway, just in case you don't watch this video, so that then you know you are actually tagged in this. Um, so yeah, anyway, I'll leave it there, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much for watching. I look forward to hearing Steve's questions on this uh, tag. And uh, yeah, I will see you in the next one. So I'll see you very soon, guys.